Hi, and welcome to section 3.4 for Econ 1 on the AQA exam board. Today, we're going to be looking at the long run average total cost curve, economies of scale, and diseconomies of scale. So, let's start by looking at the long run average total cost curve. In the long run, all factors of production are variable. The long run average total cost curve is made up from an infinite amount of short run average total cost curves. Each short run average total cost curve is drawn up on the assumption that at least one factor of production is fixed. We usually assume that the fixed factor of production is capital. So here we have a diagram below that has costs on the y axis and outputs on the x axis. The long run average total cost curve is the flat curve that's in black. The short run average total cost curves are steeper and smaller. Each short run average total cost curve will be tangent to the long run average total cost curve. By saying that each short run average total cost curve is tangent to the long run average total cost curve, we mean that the SRATC touches the LRATC. So now let's have the same diagram, but we're just going to get rid of each short run average total cost curve just because they get in the way and the diagram is much clearer without them. As this firm expands its output from Q1, the firm will experience a fall in its average total cost. The level of outputs where average total cost for the firm is at a minimum is at Q3, because this is where the average unit cost is minimised. This is the lowest point of the long run average total cost curve. If the firm was to increase outputs beyond Q3, it would mean that the average total cost would rise. Moving from a point of Q1 towards Q3 is known as economies of scale because the firm is reducing its average total cost when it is producing more goods and services. When a firm increases its output beyond a level of Q3, we say that the firm is experiencing diseconomies of scale. This is because the average total cost is rising because the firm is producing more goods and services. So let's have a look at economies of scale and diseconomies of scale in more detail. We'll start by looking at economies of scale. Economies of scale is when production becomes more efficient as the number of goods and services being produced increases. As output increases, the average cost per unit decreases. Fixed costs are a prime example of economies of scale. This is because as you increase your production, the fixed costs are spread over more units. This results in the average fixed cost falling and the average total cost falling as well. There are two different types of economies of scale that firms can experience. The first is internal economies of scale. These arise from growth within the firm. The second type of economies of scale are external economies of scale. These are economies of scale that are caused outside the firm, either within the industry or because of government policy. Here are some examples of eternal economies of scale. The first one is specialisation and the division of labour. The larger a firm becomes, the more opportunity there is for specialisation and the division of labour. Specialisation requires less training because workers only need to be trained in one job. Also, if workers are only trained in one job, it allows them to become more efficient and they can produce a greater amount of output per unit of input. There's a section on specialisation and division of labour that explains more clearly why specialisation and division of labour can reduce costs for firms and increase output. The second type of eternal economies of scale is financial economies of scale. Larger firms tend to be seen as less risky, meaning that they can obtain finance at a lower level of interest compared with smaller firms. Another internal economy of scale is marketing economies of scale. 
This is because if a company sells more products, then it decreases the advertising cost per unit of output, which increases the profit for the firm or allows the firm to charge a lower price. Also, the more advertising campaigns that the firm undertakes, the cheaper it becomes because they can negotiate lower pricing with advertising agencies. The next example of internal economies of scale is larger buying power. The more resources a firm buys, the lower the unit cost tends to be. If we look at food suppliers such as Tesco, they are able to negotiate lower prices because they buy goods and services in such large quantities. The next example is greater efficiency for larger machines. Larger machines may be more efficient because a machine may require one worker, whether it is large or small. Therefore, bigger machines result in more output per worker and a larger firm that produces more output may be able to employ larger machines than smaller firms. The next example is technological economies of scale. Large scale firms can afford to invest in new capital machinery because they can afford to take risks. For example, a company like Nets can afford to invest in the best computer system to power its website, control the tills and manage stock. This may not be the case for a smaller independent clothing store, as they wouldn't be able to afford this. This links with financial economies of scale because larger firms can gain finance easier and at a lower cost. The next example of internal economies of scale is networking economies of scale, and this especially applies to technology companies. The cost of adding extra users to a system is close to zero, but the potential income that can be generated is huge. If we look at Amazon, eBay or Facebook, it costs next to nothing to add 100,000 new users, but the potential benefits such as increased revenue through sales or advertising is huge. We can also have vertical economies of scale. As a firm grows, there is a greater opportunity to buy firms that are either above or below them in the supply chain. For example, a paper producing company may choose to buy a company that provides the trees or a company that sells paper to end users, such as staples. The final example of eternal economies of scale is risk bearing. The larger the company is, the greater possibility there is for diversification. Diversification reduces risk in a firm. If there was a shock to the economy or to one sector that the business engages in, there is a greater chance of survival if the firm is diversified. For example, let's suppose that the clothing market for menswear was to dry up completely. It's a very unlikely example, but it might happen. Next, we'll be better able to deal with this shock than a local small independent menswear retailer because Next sells women's clothes, children's clothes, and it also has a home department. Whereas the small independent shop may be at risk of going bust. As well as internal economies of scale, we can also have external economies of scale. Here are some examples. The first one is local education. This is training that is carried out within a location by someone else, such as a college training students who have some or all of the skills necessary to obtain a job. This results in there being a lower training cost for firms. Another example of an external economies of scale is investment by local authorities. Governments and councils can spend money on improving transport connections and these improvements benefit firms. A final example of external economies of scale is enterprise zones or clusters of similar firms. If many firms that are similar to each other locate near one another, they attract more workers with the sort of skills that firms in that location require. For example, Silicon Valley in America attracts many developers and coders and designers also, the City of London attracts many bankers and financiers. 
We've now looked at economies of scale, but we also have diseconomies of scale. If a firm expanded its production beyond a quantity of Q3, then the firm's average total cost would increase. This is known as diseconomies of scale. There are a variety of reasons for diseconomies of scale, and here we have some examples. The first one is management and coordination problems. As a firm grows in size, so do the lines of communication. This means that it can be hard to get an idea slash change to occur across the whole business. Also, some managers may just be managing and lose touch with the workers' jobs that they are managing, which can lead to poor decision making. And these poor decisions can lead to the average total cost of the firm increasing. Another example of diseconomies of scale is the alienation of workers. This is especially the case if there is a large amount of specialisation in the division of labour. This is because workers will be doing the same types of job and may become bored and disengaged. Workers also like to feel like they are making a difference within a company and that they are valued. It is easier to make workers feel valued and make them feel like they are making a difference in a small to medium sized company compared with a much larger sized company. Another example of diseconomies of scale is long production line issues. If there is a long production line and something goes wrong earlier on in the production process, then there is a possibility of a holdup which can be costly for firms. This is because workers may be standing idle whilst waiting for the components that they need to move along the production line. This brings us on to minimum efficient scale. The minimum efficient scale is the lowest amount of production that a company has to produce to take full advantage of economies of scale. So here we have a diagram here that has output on the x-axis and cost on the y-axis. And here we have our long run average total cost curve. Our cost curve starts by falling and this part is known as economies of scale. It then gets to a quantity of MES which is where the minimum efficient scale starts. A point from MES to Q star is where we have constant returns to scale. Constant returns to scale means that as the firm increases their output, their costs stay at the same level. The firm will then experience diseconomies of scale if they produce a level of output that is greater than Q star. We can see this because the long run average total cost curve starts to slope upwards. So it slopes downwards when the average costs are becoming lower, which is economies of scale. It stays constant when we have constant returns to scale, which is when the average total costs are the same. And then it slopes upwards when we have diseconomies of scale, which is showing that the average total cost is increasing. So what determines the minimum efficient scale? The minimum efficient scale depends on the costs that are associated with that industry. High fixed costs will result in a high quantity of output needed to achieve minimum efficient scale. These markets will be dominated by a few large firms. They will either be monopolies or oligopoly markets. If minimum efficient scale is a small percentage of market demand, then it is likely that the market will be very competitive with many firms.